guys, I'm Fancy. I'm Colleen. And this is Murder by Design. channel guys and thanks for tuning in we appreciate it this week we're going to be talking about a rather bold case it's the case of Jody Hughes and Truett Jody was a television news anchor for KIMP based in Mason City Iowa and she went missing in the early hours of June 27 1985 soon after telling a colleague that she was on her way to work and there were signs of a struggle outside of her apartment she is believed to have been affected. However, extensive investigations have failed to uncover any clues in her disappearance. Jody Husentrude was a television anchor at CBS affiliate KIMT in Mason City, Iowa. She was a beloved rising star until she disappeared on her way to work in 1995. Police discovered signs of a struggle outside her apartment building, but her body was never found. Jim Axelrod spoke to police about new potential leads in the investigation for 48 hours. You are watching News Channel 3 Daybreak. The time is 6 o'clock, 64 degrees, some light showers falling in North Iowa. This was the last viewers saw of Jody Husentrude before the popular Mason City, Iowa anchor vanished on June 27, 1995. We need your help. One of our news anchors is missing. Co-workers knew something was very wrong when Jody failed to show up for her 6 a.m. newscast at KIMT-TV. When police arrived at Jody's apartment complex, they discovered evidence of an abduction. There were, in fact, a pair of shoes, some keys, a hairdryer, and uh, some other items that were found in the parking lot in the vicinity of her car. Good Thursday morning. Welcome to Daybreak June. Jody's bubbly personality had won over her viewers. Thinking, way to go, Kevin. Could it have also made her the target of a stalker? Jody's sister, Joanne Nathy, says Jody reported an incident months earlier. She got shook up one day when she was out hiking or jogging on a trail and a black truck had followed her. But the investigation also included people Jody knew. And one friend of hers, John Van Sice, put himself on police radar by declaring he'd been the last person to see Jody alive. She was like a daughter to me. She was just like my own child. Uh, I treat her like my own child. And Back in 1995, 48 hours was on the ground in Mason City within days of Jody's disappearance. And we spent time with Van Sice. Honestly, she's alive somewhere. I just hope she's not hurt. I hope she's okay. And I hope she can come back soon. Van Sice denies involvement in Jody's disappearance. Police have not called him a suspect and confirm he passed a polygraph. But in 2017, police obtained a search warrant for GPS information on two of his vehicles. Hi, John. My name is Jim Axelrod. I'm with the CBS News Broadcast 48 Hours. Whatever information Mason City Police may have on anyone, Chief Jeff Brinkley isn't sharing. Why won't you talk about any specifics in this case? I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. Um, but is there a still... cat to, in the bag? Do you Not have something? Completely. No, no, I don't think we do yet. But I think that we're very close. This case just blows my mind because it's like a prominent person who just goes missing. This goes missing. I mean, and she was running late to work. Like they said, that was not normal for her. So this case, like you said, it's it's, it's super strange because like, um, you know, she she did she overslept, which she never like they said that was not something normal. And they spoke with her, and she was like, okay, I'm hopping in the shower, I'm getting ready, and then nothing. She just didn't show up. It appears that she got in her in her car or tried to get in her car because there's like a handprint on top of her car, but they've never been able to like link that to anybody. Um, but I mean, the day before her disappearance, she was supposed to have participated in a golf tournament, and that's according to Mason City resident John Denise. 
and she then went to his house to view a homemade videotape of a birthday celebration that he arranged for her earlier that month. And that was a strange relationship. Like a lot of people were were weirded out by that relationship because he was quite a bit older than her. And um, it always appeared like he really wanted something a little more, but that Jody really wasn't into that. They were just really good friends, but a lot of people suspected him for a while, but he's been cleared. Um, you know, I just think he was a little bit obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally a little bit obsessed. Uh, totally a little bit obsessed. Um, but you know, I don't. I don't think that he's our culprit here. I don't. I don't think that he. Oh, I really like her. And so, about four a.m. on Tuesday, June twenty seventh, nineteen ninety five, the KIMT producer Amy Coons noted no, noticed that Hughes and Truett had failed to report for work as scheduled. So she called uh, Jody's apartment, and when Jody answered the phone, she explained that she had overslept and that she was preparing to leave for the station. However, by 6 a.m., she had still not arrived, so Coons had filled in for her on the morning show, Daybreak. At about 7 a.m., KIMT staff called the Mason City Police because that was not normal at all for Jody. Jody never was really late, ever. And then for her to just not show up, period, that was really strange for them. Yeah, and so when police arrived at her apartment, they found her red Mazda Miata, which is the car that I love in the 90s. <laughs> left out in the parking lot, as well as other evidence that suggested a struggle had taken place near the car. Her personal items, including a bent car key, were strewn about the area, and the police reported recovering an unidentified palm print from her vehicle. So this is just one of those cases that it's, it's kind of like, how does a person just vanish? But I mean, at, at that time in the morning, maybe not a lot of people were up and doing anything. There were eyewitness reports, but none of them have really brought anything substantial. Um, at one point in time, you know, they were looking for like a white van. And so all the people in the white vans were being stopped. It was kind of crazy. Like anybody with a white van, you know how we feel about it's always white the vans. white vans. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, we know how we feel about these white vans. Like, good God. We had a good 10 minute conversation about it. <laughs> I think we have them all the time about these yes. vans. All the time we talk about these vans. Any car, it's usually a white van. But yeah. I just, what surprises me is that there's really just nothing to the case. There's, yeah. just, there's like a time schedule of what happened mm -hmm. that the day before and the day mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. It's just there's rumors like, and but no actual right. things. And there's a really great website. I think it's findjody.com. www.findjody.com. And they I mean they post all the different like um different theories and and everything and they talk about them and they evaluate them and they've done a lot of great work. Um there's a lot of people that run that and I really am impressed by them and what they've been doing um but it's just yeah like you said it's a lot of speculation with no evidence whatsoever as to what happened just poof it's like the springfield um, three same thing just yes poof, no information like nothing else no nothing so if you want to listen to the springfield three episode you can find it here on our channel uh we did it a couple months ago and it is super super interesting because it's like this vanished except for that was three girls Three girls. Like, that's even crazier. But if you've been listening to our podcast, The Good Wife's Guide to True Crime, then you might have noticed some changes. And that's because we recently switched our hosting platform over to Buzzsprout. And we love it. We couldn't have had a smoother transition, and Buzzsprout has made it super simple and gave us amazing features that we didn't have before. And if you've been thinking about hosting a podcast or are looking for a new host, then we recommend giving Buzzsprout a try. Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest way to launch and promote and track your podcast and your show can be online listed in all the major podcast directories like apple Podcasts, spotify google Podcasts, pandora and more within minutes of finishing your recording so join over a hundred thousand podcasters already using buzzsprout to get their message out to the world and if you follow the link in our description below that lets buzzsprout know we sent you and it gets you a 20 dollars amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan it helps support our show. So the ensuing investigation revealed that at least three neighbors in Jody's apartment complex who said that they had heard screams at the time 
that Jody would have been likely leaving for work. In addition, a nearby neighbor reported seeing a white van parked with its lights on and engine running in Jody's parking lot at about the same time, but the van was never positively identified. White vans, guys. So, I mean, the van could have been easily something that was just there in the area. It, it could have been there for repairing something, working on something in the, in the apartment complex. But then again, it could have been somebody that grabbed her, snatched her, and threw her in. Who knows? I don't, okay. suggest, I don't suggest driving a white van. No. But in September 1995, the Hughes and Truett family hired private investigators from McCarthy and Associates in turn enlisted the assistance of Omaha, Nebraska private investigator Doug Jossa. Jossa? I'm not sure. Um, McCarthy and Jossa appeared on several national television shows, including America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries. In November 1995, they and members of Jody's family traveled to Los Angeles to meet with three prominent psychics. The meeting was televised and served as the pilot for the psychic detective television show. Although each show generated several leads, none resulted in concrete evidence or identification of the suspect. I think they were just kind of like desperate for anything when mm -hmm. you're taking your private investigators and family to go talk to psychics. I think yeah. you're really on your last leg. Well, I mean, it's not that I don't believe in psychics. Like I myself have, you know, some, some abilities where, you know, I can see and, and, and have conversations, but it's not at will. Like I can't do it at will. And I think that those of them that, that do that, that a lot of them are basically snake oil salesmen. You know, like I just think that if you feel it, you feel it. That's that's one thing. But to do it, like I just don't know that it's possible for you to just absolutely just be able to pull it up like whenever you want to do it. I, I don't know if that's well I don't apps, I don't believe Spirit boxes. Oh, oh, this not, get real. <laughs> not real. Not real. Right. Okay. I think it just kind of gives hope to families that are desperate for mm -hmm. information. Yeah. And that in May 1996, about 100 volunteers searched an area of Cerro Gordo County and left flags to mark anything that appeared suspicious. Each of these sites was then re-examined by law enforcement, but no promising evidence was located. So again, people are just, they're desperate for any, any information for this case. And since Susan Truett disappeared in 1995, police and private investigators have conducted more than a thousand interviews, but none have resulted in conclusive evidence pointing to a suspect, and she was legally declared dead in May of 2001. Oh, this is another weird one. This is one that I really want to dive into. I was just talking with our friend Todd Matthews from um, the former director of NAMIS and asking him if it was one that he'd be interested in looking at. And he um, said, yeah, he might. So um, I really think this is one that I'd really like to, you know, look at all the evidence and kind of, kind of work on it and see if there is anything now that, you know, maybe they've missed or we could find or anybody could find you know so if anybody has information on this case we definitely would love to hear from you um also the people at you know findjody.com are working actively on this case to try and bring it to justice so um they have three billboards up it's it's amazing like just how much this could that people are trying to figure this case out um a well-loved person so in the community very respected well-loved had a promising future so and she's young yeah early to june 2008 photocopies of the 84 pages of jody's personal journal were anonymously anonymously mailed to a local newspaper the mason city globe gazette received the material in a large envelope with no return address and a June 4th postmark from Waterloo, Iowa. The original journal has been in the possession of law enforcement since the investigation began, so that's really strange. Within days, Mason City Police reported that the sender had come forward and was identified as the wife of the former Mason City Police Chief. Although noting that the former chief had taken a copy of the journal home when he left office, the police gave no motive as to why the woman had sent it to the newspaper. I have so many questions about that. I have so many questions. Like, did she think there was something in it that 
was going to help find somebody. Maybe there was a secret person that Jody was involved with in her life. Like, I don't but know. like why when he retired, did he make a copy of this journal and bring it yeah. home? Well, I mean, maybe, maybe he wanted he, to solve it in the future, but like, it, I feel like there's like a privacy thing. Like, you... well, I don't know because I mean, a lot of times cases when people leave, they do take they do take those things with them because it's a case that haunts them, and so they do continue to work the case even after they retire. But I don't know. But why did the wife mail it to the news? Was there something in it that she was like, maybe the newspaper can publish it? Right. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. That's such a weird thing. And then in March 2017. A search warrant was executed against John Venice, seeking GPS data from the two vehicles that he had at the time. The FBI, the Mason City Police Department, and an Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation and private investigators are still actively working on Jody's disappearance. So I think maybe they were relooking at him and trying to see where his cars were going at the time. So I guess, I mean, he was cleared at one point, but maybe they're still thinking. But I don't understand because, I mean, she clearly left the house she clearly came home from his home she just I, I think they may be thinking that he was obsessed with her and that maybe he was outside of her home and that possibly it went wrong in the morning mm-hmm. and yeah. i think that's where i kind of think that he was waiting out there and she was like well, what the hell are you doing here i gotta go to work and then maybe he tried to make a pass or something happened at that point. That's just my theory. Could it could be. Um, I, I mean, that's definitely a, a, a good assessment. Um, I know Up and Vanished just did a, um, a, a good series on this, or not a series, but an episode on this, and it's brand new um, to their, their TV show on HLN. So um, because they just, they went from being a podcast, now they've got a series. So it's a really good, actually, I really like it. Um, and they just did a whole thing on it. And they had a lot of good theories, too. So um, I really liked that one. But um, on New Year's Eve 2019, vandals defaced one of the billboards of, of the anchor woman in Mason City, Iowa. The billboard is among three in Mason City, which shows a picture of the missing news anchor asking the question, someone knows something, is it you? Cryptic words were sprayed in bright yellow paint reading, Frank Stern's Machine Shed. Across the bottom half of the billboard, Frank Stearns was a longtime detective with Mason City Police Department who diligently worked Jody's case. Now retired, Stearns is a city death scene investigator. And during 2011, the Globe Gazette reported that former Mason City Police Officer Maria Ohl accused two Mason City Police Officers and a retired Iowa Division of Criminal Investigations, PCI agent, of being involved in the abduction of the murder of Jody. Bull, a 10-year veteran, said she received credible information from an informant in 2007 and again in 2009, which implicated Lieutenant Frank Stearns, Lieutenant Ron Van Weird, and Bill Basler in the abduction. And Ohl said she told her supervisors but heard only crickets. So Ohl said they terminated her due to her handling of Jody's case information. Quote, it's horrifyingly disturbing. They're still working on taxpayers' dollars. The whistleblower was put on administrative leave and terminated. The cold case investigator, investigator Ridge spoke to Frank Stearns at his residence on January 3rd, 2020. His rural residence does have a detached building on the premises, but Stearns did not live there in 1985. So, yeah. Those theories... But I find that super interesting because why would the police want to hurt Jody? Could she have been on something? I mean, as a news anchor, she could have been exposing something that they didn't want exposed. I mean, stranger things have happened. Um, I mean, that's definitely something to look into. Hmm. And I think it's hard when there is that kind of police being accused of things a lot of times you know brothers in blue aren't going to really investigate that kind of lead yeah and that's something that we just dealt with with reporting on the rodney reed case on our podcast it airs on monday um we have a two-parter on that and a two-parter on the central park five um and it's also another thing that we're dealing with with a case that a couple of cases we're looking into in ohio like um uh kind of 
tied to police, you know, not doing what they're supposed to do and hindering investigations and all these different things. Like, I know it, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen, mm-hmm. especially if a reporter is going to blow the lid on something. I don't know. Maybe. It's interesting, interesting theory. But maybe, I mean, Denise, like you said, I mean, I'd like to believe that he was just a weird old guy that didn't do anything, but who knows? I mean, hmm. it's It's good theories. But again, you can, for more information, you can go to www.findjody, and Jody is spelled J-O-D-I dot com. Right. And we'll probably be working on this a little bit more. Um, this is one that I definitely want to dive into. Like I said, I just asked Todd if he would be interested in covering this one. But thanks for tuning in and dishing true crime with good wives and murder by design. Don't forget to join our Patreon member club. To get exclusive mini episodes, inside documents, and pictures from the cases we do, live YouTube discussions, our exclusive discussion group on Facebook. Colleen is now going to be hosting a historical podcast once a month inside of patreon so you're going to want to catch that and we also have some good amazing wives merch we're going to see us wearing pretty soon because i think we're going to have a couple of those so follow us on twitter and instagram at true crime wives and for more insight information check out our podcast the good wives guide to true crime on any of your favorite podcast players have a good one from the good wives serving up true crime one inch at a time Hi guys!